Welcome back to my disembodied voice. Today, I want to talk about Denzel Washington and his brilliant performance as Robert McCall in The Equalizer. Now, as ever, I'm not reviewing the two films here, although for the record, I quite like them. I instead want to look at how Denzel portrayed The Equalizer and how his military history, personal grief, obsessive compulsive disorder and his power and control made Robert so believable. Just for context, I'm not talking about the Queen Latifah series because I've only ever seen the pilot and so it would be unfair to try and add anything from that series into this essay. I've been meaning to watch the new Reimagining But with a full-time job, YouTube channel, new book almost finished and too many documentaries to catch up on Netflix. It's slipped right to the bottom of my pile. Quick backstory first. Back in the late 80s, when I used to stay up late in our household so I could commandeer the TV when everyone else went to bed, I used to watch a late night show called The Equalizer starring Edward Woodward. The Equalizer was about a guy who stood up for those outnumbered, whose odds were stacked against them and who needed help. Woodward used more shouting and intimidation than punching and beating the living snot out of people, but his methods were the same in terms of his morality. Once on a case, he would offer the predator or wrongdoer the chance to do the right thing, which was always declined, before setting out to make things right by whatever means necessary. Running from 1985 to 1989, the fifth season renewed then cancelled for a myriad of reasons, Woodward's equaliser character was perceived to be sort of a direct port from the protagonist he played in the TV drama Callan, where Woodward played the titular character who carried out gritty jobs for Queen and Country. This was back in the 1960s, by the way. By today's standards, Woodward's equaliser looks dated and, while still enjoyable, it was in desperate need of an update. When Denzel Washington was announced for the 2014 film, I was initially disappointed. Not because I don't like Washington, he's a fantastic actor and screen legend. I love Man on Fire and Unstoppable, two films just to name but a few. But I couldn't see him having the gravitas of Woodward's acidic and ruthless demeanour. However, I'm an idiot and should have trusted the big man to take and shape the character into something which was both contemporary and completely believable. In the 2014 reboot, Robert McCall is an ex-agent of the Defence Intelligence Agency and also achieved the rank of Gunnery Sergeant in the Marine Corps. He has done some things he isn't proud of in his life and, after faking his own death so he could live with the love of his life Vivian, he lived off the grid with her until she passed away. This becomes part of his motivation to help others where possible. McCall and I'll refer to him from that from now on rather than Denzel as we're focusing only on the 2014 movie and its 2018 sequel, starts the movie working in a low-rent job. Loved by everyone but detached from intimate social circles, he is everyone's friend but a perpetual mystery to them all. He doesn't sleep well, spends his time reading, this is partly to honour his wife's challenge of reading a hundred specific books before he dies, as Vivian only managed 97 before she passed away, and he also spends his nights in a local coffee shop, diner, where he reads and drinks tea. It's here that he meets the lovable loser Terry, who is a prostitute and punching bag for the local division of the Russian mob, and she becomes the catalyst of his progression and involvement into the equaliser we see in earnest at the end of the film. What I love about the 2014 version is the nuance in McCall's performance and, balanced against my experiences of working with OCD, counselling ex-military vets, maybe not Marines, but disciplined and truly inspirational army soldiers all the same, and also watching movies where injustice and imbalanced odds are instrumental character themes, Denzel does something rather special with the character. First things first, I want to talk about power and control. Now, when I speak about power and control... They are both relevant in terms of mental and physical states. It's important to remember in any form of psychology, personality study or character analysis that mental and physical are symbiotic and fully coagulated together in terms of how they affect each other. Now, as a former Marine, McCall is physically powerful and we see this during the fight scenes. However, to be a Marine and something which is instilled via training and the regimen of discipline which comes with the army, he is also mentally powerful. This is all part of their training where they operate firearms, do aquatic endurance and also marksmanship. Navy SEALs, who also have a challenging regime, are put through horrific endurance trials and, to make sure they have the mental metal, much like Marines, they use four pillars of mental toughness which are number one, talk positively to yourself, self-mental mentorship, Number two, setting goals, both being realistic and ambitious at the same time. Number three, practice visualisation, rehearsing routines and find ways to see a result to stop them from breaking. Number four, 
arousal control, finding ways to calm via breathing or visualisation. This mental fortitude is crucial when it comes to coping with their truly terrifying endurance training and, when it comes to McCall, this explains his mental discipline too. However, as often explored in comic book tropes where average people become overpowered superheroes, they need both, and thank you Uncle Ben, responsibility, but also control as, without it, they are no better than the villains that they fight. McCall admits during the film that he has done things in the past he is not proud of, but through balancing a moral conscience against the deprogrammed lethality which enables him to kill people, he contains that side of him and controls it via repression and living a life of anonymity and low stimulus. Psychological power and control are crucial as Marines cannot panic, must stay focused, excel in everything they do but retain a mental balance over their strength. McCall is shown doing this frequently in both films, but more so in the first. He can easily take out the thugs who are abusing the young prostitute Terry, but he stays calm and bides his time, even offering remuneration of a few thousand dollars to buy the girl's freedom so he doesn't lose himself to the darkness and power of the side of him which, once let loose, can kill without hesitation. Later in the film, when asking the bent cops to return the money they stole, he keeps to his values of giving them the option, but here we see another change as his calm quota of talking quickly escalates and he almost has to rein himself in from going too far when berating and threatening the officers who are terrorising the community. Part of the reason for this is that the police are supposed to protect and serve and uphold ideals, just like people in the military, and this infuriates him. Denzel Washington portrays this personality characteristic perfectly throughout the film, keeping a calm lid on things whilst holding back the whirlwind of unfettered rage which could do more damage than he can control. Now he does state in the film, when threatening head honcho Nikolai, that he left this dark personality behind and would never become that person again as he promised someone he loved. McCall is a man of his word, another restraint of control to the power that he has and this love of his life is the person who saved him and gave him a new code to live by. The Marines built this man, yet this woman inherited him. Here, in the scene with his new nemesis, he details the henchmen of Nikolai he has killed and again states he gave them the same choice he is now giving Nikolai. McCall knows that the answer is going to be no and war is coming but for his conscience he needs to ease what's coming next and to cope mentally with what will be unleashed as he needs to offer them the choice first. This means that his victim is as much to blame for their deaths as he is. They had a choice. They could have stopped what's coming. Throughout the scene, and explained in articles and interviews by Denzel promoting the film, we see the OCD that torments and comforts him. For clarity, OCD, or Obsessive Compulsive Disorder to give it its full name, involves intrusive thoughts which have compensatory actions to alleviate their stress. The nine major symptoms of OCD are compulsive behaviour, cleaning and hand washing, checking, such as checking doors are locked or that the gas is off, counting, ordering and arranging, hoarding, asking for reassurance, repeating words in the head and thinking, neutralising thoughts to counter the obsessive thoughts. Now, you don't need all for a diagnosis, but OCD is a disorder of over-control. Over-control is where extremely rigid thought patterns, difficulty tolerating change and uncertainty and the repetition of mental rituals can become so detrimental that life can become almost unbearable. In terms of neurobiosocial studies for radically open dialectical behaviour therapy, the treatment now recommended for overcontrol, it was found that in extreme overcontrol, behaviour responses were more rigid and less susceptible to change. It also leaves the subject in a constant form of danger as the valences of safety are low arousal and any threat valences cause high arousal. The person is always trying to control things and be in a place of safety, but as there is always more rituals needed to keep them in this place of safety, threat overshadows any peace of mind gained by this ordering and ritualistic behaviour. McCall isn't tormented to the point where he can't leave the house but everything needs to be in his control and his rituals get worse when he is in an environment that could present risk. Denzel does this brilliantly as, when out in the diner, he always lines up his book to the edge of the table and keeps everything neat. He does this even when threatening Nikolai, spending time adjusting napkins, knives and fork arrangement and it gets worse when he is forced to become violent. Opening and shutting a door three times before a massacre being the best example. Denzel doesn't overplay these but take the assault on the diner when an assassin is sent for him and he knows immediately. His attention to near forensic detail saves his life. Spotting the worker has clean hands. 
the only cue he needs to read the whole room that something is wrong, that there is an incongruity and the order of the world is out of place, he immediately sees the threat and reacts. The military is about discipline and, having been a counsellor for several ex-veterans in my time, that discipline stays with them and it's a wonderful touch, a clearly visual one for the film, which shows McCall's survival instinct, reading a room always on guard for peculiarities and also the need to control the environment by making sure he completes rituals. For someone who was probably faced with losing their life time and time again in dangerous situations, the mental mark is tangible and adds a wonderful depth to this mercilessly violent yet gentle-mannered man who only has empathy for the good people in his life. In the second film, McCall is now a fully-fledged equaliser and thus his character has grown somewhat. The change in him is now to be expected as, finally a freelance vigilante who rights wrongs for those who cannot stand up for themselves, he is both more at ease with himself and more gregarious in his community. Doing odd jobs between beating people to a pulp and rescuing stolen children, the most memorable scene in the film is the revenge he dishes out for the sexual assault victim who gets placed in his taxi. Returning to the apartment and dealing out a beating to the slimy guys who abused Amy, the point being none of them know her name after treating her like a piece of meat, the scene is both brutal and shows McCall's calmness while still asking them to do the right thing and hand in their phones. This is paralleled by a cathartic beatdown and surprising lack of tolerance when he aggressively grabs the face of the weakest member of the gang with a truly memorable snarl at the culmination of the fight. The ending to the second film sadly mirrors the first, McCall taking on a small army of heavily armed men, but this time in an open space instead of a warehouse. But the second film is more personal as, furious at the Mandalorian's Pedro Pascal for killing his best friend, he lets the thugs know there is no choice this time and he will kill them all. But sadly, the only problem is that he can only do this once. Whilst the sequel is ballsier and McCall's OCD seems to have eased somewhat compared to the previous film, he painfully relives the feeling of grief from when he lost his wife when the Mandalorian kills his friend and this truly resurrects the beast inside of him. But as ever with the Equalizer, there is still control. The scene where he uses the Mandalorian's wife and children as brazen human shields via a wink and a smile at the point where the gang are set to execute him shows the nonchalance of his mental state as it is juxtaposed with the promise of how he will slaughter them all. McCall's watch setting before each beatdown isn't necessarily connected to his OCD. This is more about him setting a timer so he can monitor his speed and efficiency, another trick from marine training where everything from press-ups to firearms prep is timed, but his raising of eyebrows and mumbles about slowness or genial surprise about the amount of seconds he dispatches the goons in is both quirky and dark. So, McCall has OCD, but is there a strong case for obsessive compulsive personality disorder? Well, Obsessive compulsive personality is a personality disorder focused on rigid adherence to rules and regulations, an overwhelming need for order, unwillingness to yield or give responsibilities to others and a sense of righteousness about the way things should be done. I don't think McCall is necessarily obsessive compulsive personality disorder as this often severely impairs social and family functioning and McCall lived a happy life with Vivian and in both film holds down work and friendships. His exclusion from social circles is by choice not ritualistic misery and he doesn't suffer from any adaptability to new scenarios and doesn't get distressed via perfectionism. In war zones and peacekeeping, attention to detail is paramount as one wrong move or lapse in concentration can cause your death and, once out at home and in civic life, it's hard to switch off the attention to detail as that sense of continuous observation, scrutiny and rituals of either luck or regiment stay with the soldier and can often result in OCD presentation. In the Marines, McCall needed to switch between humanitarian and cold-blooded killer and would have always been on guard for danger. Now back in the real world after faking his death and living a low-key life, it's no wonder the habits and focuses which kept him alive remain a part of his mental schemata and intrapsychic mechanisms. This brings us on to Maya Briggs' detailed 16 personality types and, as I'm going to use these more on this channel, let's close this essay by looking at which one Robert McCall is. Right, please feel free by the way to pause and look at this in more depth because it's really hard to talk through this bit by bit. Basically, the 16 personality types are made up of four characteristics, each one labelled by a letter. I'll leave the two slides up for a minute while I talk, just so you can see and look through them. The equaliser is an ISTJ type. This means, according to the Maya Briggs chart, that he comes in as a logistician. The acronym ISTJ stands for introversion, sensing, thinking and judgment. Basically, he is formal in appearance, cultured with an affection towards tradition whilst quiet and usually calm. ISTJ are rule followers who always take the logical approach towards their goals and projects. Their dominant cognitive function is introverted sensing which helps them take in the details about their environment whilst their auxiliary cognitive function is extroverted thinking which makes them efficient and logical thinkers. In their relationships, they are very loyal to their friends and family members. 
Usually, they have a small circle who they prefer spending their time with. The ISTJ thrives in jobs that require structure, logic and stability. There is no doubt Robert McCall fits all these factors and, both moulded by the army and forged from switching between killer and carer, he has to close parts of his mind to some things whilst truly appreciating the finer details in others. Killing people requires a level of detachment and many soldiers talk about not seeing their victims as people and, in a way, the moral test decides that for McCall. If they do the right thing, if they take his choice, they are human, decent and not someone he can harm. Yet, if they decline, they fail and they then fall into the category of illogical and therefore just a piece or item which needs to be removed or deservedly killed. McCall doesn't want to kill, apart from those who killed his friend, which is pure retribution, so he uses logic to deduce if someone is worth saving or hurting. It's logical rationalisation and, therefore, something which requires mental processing. And OCD people put everything through a mental processing loop to ensure maximum control. Power and control are key to McCall as they both work symbiotically to keep him alive and to the word he gave the now departed love of his life. Much like Peter Parker honours Uncle Ben by using responsibility in his power, McCall is only ever a hair's breadth away from the merciless killer he once was. Without a conscience, morals, military training and promise, he has no limits to how far he could go and he knows this so codes, rules, control, balance and order must always be adhered to so he can remain the person he promised to be while always controlling an environment which has hazards. He believes in doing the right thing, which is why he offers his victims the option of decency first and his over control is wonderfully nuanced by Denzel from his actions and rituals to the soft spoken voice which, even when things are at their worst, never really shouts or screams. He is a man in control of his power, but when pushed to needs must, his power is controlled and he targets only those there is no redemption for. Perhaps the only time we see his rules discarded is when he discovers that the Mandalorian has killed his friend and, feeling his rage and the inevitability of blood staining his hands, he deals in ultimatums. He still doesn't lose his temper during this scene, he still keeps his voice monotone, but the cultivated monster underneath is taking over and there'll be no variables in this outcome. The locus of control switches, this time the only control and focus is making sure that these people die. The Equalizer is getting a third film, which shows Denzel's love for the character as he generally doesn't do sequels and this means we should get a proper arc for his gentle speaking yet ruthless character. Anyway, that's it for now, so until next time, I'll catch you later. I'm gonna kill each and every one of you and the only disappointment in it for me is that I only get to do it once.